that uh, uh, can be found underneath us is the failure to compare EIS. And the three uh, basic questions here is, is it a major federal action? Talk about, uh, does the action potentially have significant impacts on the human environment? And third, what are the scope of those impacts? Secondly, even if an EIS is prepared, is it adequate? Challenging the adequacy of a, an EIS that has been prepared by an agency. So um, some of the things that the, uh, might be subjects of challenge is, has the project been defined properly? Um, what is the uh, project's purpose? How has that been defined? Um, have the impacts uh, been analyzed properly? Uh, so that includes you know, so this, um, all of the possible impacts, um, the method of analysis, um, you know, and so forth. So there are issues here relating to tiering of impacts, uh, of the analysis of impacts, uh, looking at cumulative or synergistic impacts, uh, supplemental analysis of impacts, uh, the degree of specificity, dealing with predictable impacts versus very speculative impacts, and the geographic scope, which, you know, in terms of looking at uh, you know, how far out uh, you're analyzing the impacts. Uh, alternatives that uh, have alternatives been considered and analyzed, has mitigation been considered and analyzed? One of the big things about um, NEPA is that it requires, in the impact analysis, a consideration of a reasonable range of alternatives to the agency's actions. You analyze the agency's action, but then comparing it to a reasonable range of alternatives, including the no action alternative, including the no action alternative. But this is why the definition of project's purpose is so important because very often the agency will say, well, if we took no action, obviously there would be no or few environmental impacts, but we could not achieve the purpose for which we are taking the action. Right? That tends to be the way the analysis goes. And you're like, well, that seems obvious, but they need to do it. They need to say it, right? Uh, because part of the whole idea is to call attention to, to the public's attention to the fact that there are adverse impacts on the environment from the agency's action, and one alternative is simply not to take the action, but then what are, what, what's, what are the trade-offs involved in that? Obviously, you wouldn't achieve whatever the, the purpose of the project uh, was. And then finally, there are procedural uh, ch uh, actions, or the, uh, the challenges to uh, the agency's uh, alleged failure to follow the proper procedures. That includes the timing of the analysis, the timing of engaging in uh, the environmental impact uh, assessment process. Um, is a draft EIS been made available to the public? Uh, has the public had an opportunity to comment on the draft EIS? And then there's other specific procedures uh, that, you know, just as sort of a placeholder, just to let you know that you, you uh, may have to look at some very specific kinds of procedures depending on what kind of action you have. So this is the basic language, um, at 42 U.S.C. section 4332, that's section 102 of NEPA, and it says Congress authorizes and directs that to the fullest extent possible, all agencies of the, of the federal government shall, okay, so non-discretionary duty, right, shall include in every recommendation or report on proposals for legislation or other major federal actions significantly affecting the quality of the human environment, a detailed statement by the responsible official on the environmental impact of the proposed action. Okay. So that's the language. Um, and then uh, there are what are called uh, CEQ regulations. CEQ is the Council on Environmental Quality, and um, these um, uh, regulations, um, interpret NEPA, the terms of NEPA, they establish procedural requirements uh, to satisfy NEPA, and they also impose uh, some new substantive requirements consistent with the statute's purpose. Uh, that last part, as you might guess, could possibly be uh, more questionable nowadays with the sort of uh, uh, question about the, the non-delegation doctrine. Has Congress delegated too much authority to the Council on Environmental Quality to create new law, in essence, as opposed to merely interpreting and implementing the statute? Uh, who knows how that would, that would go, but that's the, the gist. Um, so, uh, okay, so what, one of the things that, um, we're talking about is obviously when the government is going to act, actually act in a way uh, that is uh, going to have a significant impact on the environment, they're going to have to do an EIS. But when they are considering a proposal, either a proposal for legislation or a proposal for action, either to adopt a, a set of regulations, to adopt a, a set of uh, action items that they're going to take, they're going to cut um, you know, uh, uh, trees in the forest, uh, they're going to build a road, uh, you know, uh, they're going to manage the uh, national park in some new way, uh, or so on and so forth, they um, have to, to um, you know, engage in environmental impact analysis. Okay? So not um, just um, actions themselves, but proposals, recommendations for legislation, that sort of thing. When the statute says major federal actions significantly affecting the environment, the CEQ regulations say that major reinforces but does not have a meaning independent of significantly. So basically, a major federal action um, is one that significantly affects the, uh, the human environment. Um, this applies to new actions, but also continuing actions when a decision is made to continue that activity. Um, and there's sort of four major categories, an adoption of official policy, adoption of formal plans, adoption of programs, and approval of specific projects. All of those are gonna trigger uh, the uh, environmental impact um, assessment. Um, Significant impacts on human environment. CEQ regulations say there are two factors to consider, context and intensity. Context meaning you know, understanding the context, the environmental context in which the action is going to occur. And then uh, intensity is the intensity of the action uh, and its impacts on the environment. Okay? Uh, and if it's uh, a sensitive context or if it's a relatively uh, significant uh, intensity, neither of those will trigger the requirement to do an EIS because that will be considered significant impacts on the human environment. Okay? Um, cumulative actions. Uh, uh, have to be, uh, cumulative impacts have to be considered, okay, so when you're looking at cumulative impacts, but you also have to think about cumulative actions, okay, so action A leads to action B, which leads to action C, and so on and so forth, and at what stage do you have to do uh, an EIS? So we're going to talk about that, we're going to look at some, some examples of that. Um, the agency doing the environmental impact um, uh, analysis, now by the way, each agency does their own, okay, right, each agency does their own, and they're looking at short and long-term effects, um, and they also have to look at unique and endangered uh, resources. So, um, I didn't get my act together, we actually had too much to do, but I was, I was uh, going to, uh, Play some Luis Fonsi uh, before class. Uh, we, uh, to help you remember that one of the acronyms uh, in um, um, 
uh, in NEPA law is on C, which is a finding of no significant impact. Okay, so that's one of the options instead of preparing an EIS. And so in which case can you do that? So let's look at the process. So we start with here's an idea out there. Uh, might be from within the agency. It might be outside the agency. So there's an idea. Hey, we ought to cut these trees in the forest. We ought to build this road, right? Uh, we ought to um, you know, approve this power plant in this neighborhood, right? There's any number of uh, possible ideas. It is not until the idea becomes an actual proposal that NEPA kicks in. Okay? It's not until the idea becomes an actual proposal. So um, if, the, uh, if, if this is just one of many uh, things the agency uh, wants to just sort of kick around and discuss without having a, a specific proposal to do something, so like when they say, hey, let's have a discussion next week about various kinds of road building projects. Or let's have a uh, let's have a um, a, a uh, video conference with several different uh, folks in the agency to talk about uh, assessing and, and considering the environmental impacts of power plants on low income neighborhoods of color. Right. So they will say, uh, hey, we ought to uh, talk about that. We ought to kick these ideas around. So that is not yet a proposal. Okay, let me see that. On the other hand, if you're at the point at which you say, okay, well, we're going to build this road, and now we've got to start thinking about awarding contracts for the building of this road. Now you have already passed the point of the proposal. Right. So, so, so the key is when you have a proposal. Um, and in order to, um, uh, you know, to, to move forward with the pro proposal, you have to make an initial decision. The agency is going to be considering the proposed action. is going to have to make an initial decision about whether this qualifies over on the right as a categorical exclusion. Okay, so the statute has a variety of categorical exclusions that apply. So let me use, you might imagine, you know, things like national security and so on and so forth, uh, emergency responses, etc. Um, so that's uh, one possibility. It's a fairly limited list, and what your your proposal has to clearly and squarely fall into the uh, categorical exclusion before you can take advantage of it. Say, hey, we don't have to prepare the EIS because this is categorically excluded from NEPA. And so that's that's uh, one possibility. Um, another possibility is just to go forward with the EIS. I just say, hey, we know that building this entire this, this proposal to build this entire interstate across six states, you know, over how many ever acres of land and so forth, is a major federal action that's going to significantly affect the environment. So we we can go straight to preparing an EIS. Okay? So if that's the case, you can just go ahead. If, on the other hand, there is some uncertainty about whether this is substantial enough and its impact on the environment, or substantial enough of a project to require an environmental uh, impact uh, statement to do, to do the full study, then what happens is the agency prepares is called an environmental assessment, an EA, environmental assessment. So we, we have, um, uh, so, so we've got EIS, yes, now we've got EA, and the EA is sort of an initial first, uh, way of looking at the proposal to sort of lay out, okay, what might be the impacts? What's, what is the project? What's, what, what, uh, you know, what's gonna be involved with the project? And what kinds of environmental impacts might it have? If the agency um, feels very confident that the uh, project is not going to have any significant impact on the environment, they prepare a FONSI, a finding of no significant impact, okay? FONSI. Um, and then um, if they do decide to do an EIS, they, then they proceed with the EIS. At whatever stage a decision is made, the agency also has to prepare what's called a ROD, a record of decision. ROD, and I know it's not up there, so you have to add it to your notes, ROD, record of decision. And, and that is basically a procedural requirement that, they, that allows people to track what decision was made. Right? Does everybody see that? Okay, so that's something that gets published in the Federal Register. Actually, all this stuff gets published in the Federal Register. Okay? So, but that way we know what decision was made. The, one of the things that can happen uh, with um, uh, the FONSI, the, and by the way, agencies love doing FONSI, right? To find, to find no significant impact. Why do they love to do that? Other than that, they, they uh, want to play Despacito on their, on their computer. So why do they want to do that? Is it easier? Easier in what way? Less time consuming. Less time consuming. Less money. Right. Less money. Uh, uh, less, uh, consumption of agency resources, time, money, staff, attention, etc. You move forward with the action more quickly, right? Of course. Agencies um, do not. They, they, agencies have some competing incentives, but one set of incentives are all about avoiding the time and effort and work and so forth of an environmental accident. Anybody ever reviewed an EIS or looked at one? Anybody? Yes. Okay. Two of you. Okay. Uh, how long are they? Um, if you count all the tables and stuff, they're huge. You're massive, just massive, okay? This is very detailed descriptions of all possible environmental impacts, everything that the agency's gonna do, what's all involved in it, what kinds of impacts it's gonna have. You just think about it, right? There's, there's pollution, there's different kinds of pollution, there's, there's um, different kinds of species that are gonna be affected, uh, different uh, kinds of uh, ecosystems that are gonna be affected, there's gonna be human communities that are affected, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's gonna be a lot of scientific uh, data that's gathered, there's gonna be modeling, because you don't know for sure what the impacts are, you're gonna have to predict them, right? And so, you know, and, and various contingencies, what well, we do this, but that happens, right? So what happens if we take this action and, there's, and there are these various effects of climate change? So we have one climate model that says, suggests this. What happens it's a different model of climate change. What if it's you know, wetter, what if it's drier, right? So all that kind of analysis has to go in there. What happens if there's a major hurricane? What happens if there's a major earthquake, right? I mean, there's a variety of different kinds of, of things that go into this. What happens if the agency gets partly into the project and the funding dries up, right? I mean, so, so like, are the environmental impacts of a interstate that's half completed different in any kind of way than the completed project? Is everybody seeing that? And so that's, you know, that those sorts of things uh, might be uh, significant. So, so um, now, having said that, agencies also know that if they don't do an EIS, they're gonna be sued, right? If they don't do an EIS, they're gonna be sued. So, you get sometimes different kinds of judgments made within the agency about whether, you know, whether we really have to do one or whether maybe it's safer to go ahead and do it, right? I mean, so that's, that's, a, that's a judgment call. But what they're looking for are ways that they can sort of 
minimize the risk of losing in litigation. And listen, listen to what I said there, losing in litigation. Not to minimize the risk of being sued. All sorts of people will sue the agency for all sorts of reasons, right? And that doesn't necessarily mean the plaintiffs would have a winning claim. They might or might not. Okay? But do not ever, ever tell your client, well, if you do this, you won't be sued. Okay? That, you're, you're just setting yourself up for a, a, a problem with your client when that your client ends up being sued. Right? What you want to do is you want to say, oh, if you're sued, if you do this, and then you're sued, we have a very good chance of winning. Right? Does everybody see the difference in that? Because I mean, the lawsuits, I mean, sometimes the lawsuits are just going to, I mean, sometimes plaintiffs think they can win, and sometimes the lawsuits are there because um, it's a way of putting more pressure on your client and what they're trying to do and so forth. So, so don't tell them they're not going to get sued. But the agency says, hey, you know, we, we will be in a better position to defend ourselves if we do X, Y, and Z. Well, one of the possibilities is what's called a mitigated Ponzi. Okay? So let's assume this is the uh, impact of the original proposal, and this is the threshold of significance, and it crosses the threshold of significance, right? Okay, it does. But now the agency adopts some proposed mitigation measures that offset the impacts such that the net impacts are now below the threshold of significance, right? And so agencies might want to choose to do that. They might just want to say, we're going to, to move forward with this proposal, we're going to issue a Ponzi, but it's going to be a mitigated Ponzi, and our proposal will include in it this mitigation measure, this proposed mitigation measure that we will do. That, um, yeah, so, so it might be, uh, for example, um, there might be some adverse impacts to wetlands, but you might offset them, uh, and that might be significant, but if you do some restoration of some adjacent wetlands that have been degraded, now you can offset that, and the net impact is below the level of significance. Does that make sense everybody? Okay. So that is what a mitigated policy does. Okay. So again, remember what we're trying to do with NEPA is to get agencies to take a hard look at the environmental impacts of their actions before they take the action. We want the agencies to publicly disclose the details of the proposed projects and actions and their likely environmental impacts, um, and that, that NEPA is a, um, a source or a center for uh, the generation of litigation uh, over this, but at the same time, NEPA is a set of procedural duties. It does not impose any substantive requirements to actually protect the environment. Instead, it is about um, uh, acknowledging the environmental impacts, considering them when you're making your decision, considering the alternatives, and that sort of thing. Okay, so again, this is just a review of what we're about the possible challenges. So let's start with the, the first kind of uh, question, which is, um, is an EIS required? And to give you a feel for the kind of uh, questions that can get asked, um, there's this famous um, case, uh, Puppy versus Sierra Club, where the, um, the US, uh, um, uh, the, the federal government had a plan uh, for coal leasing, okay? some coal leases, uh, uh, leases of lands and, and, uh, to be uh, mined for coal. Um, and they developed, um, uh, they had sort of a national program that they're going to um, have some standards and principles and policies and so forth in place for how lands get set, uh, identified uh, and leases get considered, lease, uh, proposals for leases get considered. Um, then they organized all this around regions. And so this is what shows you what the regions are, the Appalachian Basin, the Gulf Coast, which actually really isn't none of that, because you can see it's not really on the Gulf Coast, uh, um, but, uh, but you get the idea. Um, the Western Interior, the Illinois Basin, the Colorado Plateau, and the Northern Rocky Mountains and Great Plains. Uh, which, by the way, if you can imagine, there are grassland and prairie dog issues in here, right? Okay, so it's not a case about grasslands and prairie dogs, you just to call your attention to that. All right, and then, of course, they're gonna make decisions on a lease-by-lease -lease basis. And what happens is Sierra Club sues um, over um, this, uh, the, this, the regional, uh, programs, okay, so the regional programs. And they say, these regional programs exist and no EIS was ever prepared. And they have to, in order to organize and, and implement this leasing program on a region by region basis, they have to actually um, prepare an EIS. And the court says, no, they don't. No, they don't because there is no existing or proposed plan or program at the regional level. This is a way <laughs> of taking a national policy, organizing it region by region, but the actual uh, action is lease by lease. Right? The, act, the actual action that the government takes is on, is on a, on a lease by lease uh, basis. This is, this is merely for administrative convenience to have this sort of regional organizing. Okay? Um, so this is yeah, just a reminder of the language, right? Every recommendation or report of proposals for legislation, well, that's not bad, or other major federal actions. So the question is, what's a major federal action? Um, and the court says there is no action here. Um, they point out that in the purpose section, NEPA's purpose is not to generate paperwork, even excellent paperwork, but to foster excellent action. So um, something that you could probably appreciate. Okay? Um, and, um, the uh, statute also says that the um, agency shall integrate the NEPA process with other planning at the earliest possible time to ensure that planning decision, decisions reflect environmental values to avoid delays later in the process and to head off below, uh, potential conflicts. So the, the statute itself emphasizes early NEPA process, right? Get, get, consider environmental impacts early on, but it says in terms of timing, as close to possible, as close as possible to the time the agency is developing or is presented with a proposal so that it can be included in a, and so on and so forth in the decision making on the proposal. That's, that's, that's what it says, okay, right? Okay, so do you see some tension there in the statute itself? As early as possible, but it's close to the consideration of the proposal, right? Because there's obviously that can be a tension there, right? Okay, so, um, uh, so, so you've got both uh, language. Um, but lo and behold, the statute also defines what proposal means. So a proposal exists 
And the best agent of the development of an action where when an agency subject to the act has a goal and is actively prepared to make a decision on one or more alternative means of accomplishing that goal, the effects can be meaningfully evaluated. Preparation of the environmental impact statement should, shall, uh, or should be timed so the final statement may be completed in time for the statement to be included in any recommendation reporting the proposal. A proposal may exist, in fact, as well as by the agency declaration that one exists. Okay, so basically the statute says just because the agency doesn't call it a proposal doesn't mean that it's not a proposal, right? Isn't that an invitation for the court to look at what the agency is actually doing and compare it to the definition? Okay, because again, the definition. Okay? Uh, agency has a goal and is actively preparing to make a decision on one or more alternative means of accomplishing that goal and the effects can be meaningfully evaluated. Okay, so one of the things I want to encourage you is this is an environmental law. Tie yourself to, the, to this language, it's the statute, this is what it says. So when you're sort of saying, hey, does the agency have a proposal or not? Come right back to that and apply that, okay? And obviously, it can be interpreted in uh, any number of different ways, right? But the, um, the gist is, um, in Clepping versus Sierra Club, is the organizing of these leases uh, okay, at a regional level is not a proposal for an agency action. There's no, uh, there, there's no uh, decision on one or more alternative means of accomplishing the goal. Instead, what they're saying, and they also say the effects can't be meaningfully evaluated, the effects can be meaningfully evaluated only on a lease by lease basis, when you know actually what's going to be leased and where it's going to be and what kind of impact it's going to have. And that's the point at which the agency is considering an you know, action that would implement its goals. Right? Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so that's what's, that's what's going on in Clapping versus Sierra. I'm going to skip through the next uh, couple of slides because they're just repeats. Um, so, standards of judicial review, obviously, they're looking for the, is the agency complying with the statute, is the uh, agency complying with CEQ regulations, um, and this is typical stuff, you know, how much deference does the CEQ regulations get? We talk all about the you know, Chevron deference and so on and so forth, right? So, but basically, substantial deference, okay? Um, and this is um, very, uh, just basically review, okay? So rule of reason, is, um, this is a new thing here. So in the NEPA category, NEPA area, uh, the courts will often use the term rule of reason when they apply the arbitrary and capricious standard, okay? Not just, you've know, been in law school long enough, you know that reasonable just gets thrown out there a lot, and you know, obviously the court is making some decisions, have some judgments about what's reasonable or not. But this is basically, you know, we're gonna defer to the agency's discretion if the exercise of discretion is reasonable in light of NEPA and the CDQ regulations, okay? Um, obviously it's not, and it's arbitrary and capricious and an abuse of the agency's discretion. Um, I wouldn't get too caught up on the difference between arbitrary, capricious, and an abuse of discretion. It appears to me, in all these cases, that the courts just kind of use that interchangeably. That's pretty loose and not very satisfactory, but it is what it is. Um, the court gives some deference based on the agency's specialized expertise and competency, but the underlying statutory purpose, Congress's intent, is for the agencies to follow these procedural requirements. So the agency does not have any, any special expertise to decide to skip the procedures or to avoid doing the EIS altogether. Where you get deference based on the agency's specialized expertise or competency is where there may be disagreements about exactly what the impacts are. Okay, so if the agency scientists say the impacts are you know, A, B, and C, and the environmental group that's suing say the impacts are A, B, C, D, and E, <coughs> well, you know, the, uh, the court might defer to the agency uh, so long as the agency considered D and E and has um, uh, uh, expertise-based, so in other words, scientifically-based, evidence-based uh, reason for rejecting DNA. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So that's, um, that's the gist of the standard of judicial review. Um, so um, coming back to the Cleppy versus Sierra Club case, um, we, we, had, we had a question about whether there was a federal proposal, and they said no. Um, and, um, but they did say that the, a single comprehensive EIS could be required when several proposed actions are pending at the same time that will have cumulative or synergistic impacts in the region. So if there are a dozen leases, they're all being considered around the same time and taken together, they would have cumulative, that's additive, right? Impacts, you know, let's say, you just put a number on them. Let's, let's say, lease number one is gonna have an impact of 17. Lease number two is gonna have an impact of 13. And lease number three is gonna have an impact of four. And so on, so when you add it all out, that's cumulative. Synergistic impact is how they intersect or, or the, with each other. So, so, you know, synergistic is, you know, you add two things together, it's bigger than just the addition of the two because they interact with each other, right? So, I mean, you know this like from just like, elementary school science. You, know, you put one thing in, you put the other thing in, and it explodes, and it bubbles, or it does something. It's something more than just the two things together, right? right? So that's synergistic impact. Um, and so both cumulative and synergistic impacts will have to be considered. And why? Why? Because, think about this. Let's assume that, um, that coal mining company wants to get a dozen different leases from the federal government in Wyoming, all in the same general area, but each is in a somewhat different place, okay? And all they get them around the same time. But they're sort of close together, but you see why it's in the interest of the mining company, and perhaps in the interest of the federal agency, to treat those as 12 totally separate pro proposals, none of which by itself is going to have a significant impact on the human environment. Okay. So you see why that, that, that would be, that would save a lot of time and effort, right? You just have 12 different decisions, <laughs> and all of them have fancies, right? So it's like, okay, but I mean, it's the same company, it's the same coal mining, it's, like, it's all in the same region, they're all going to be really, in essence, having either cumulative or, and or synergistic impacts together. Okay? So then the agency, uh, in that case, would have to, um, to consider them together in one, in one EIS. So who gets to make that decision? So Cleppy versus Sierra Club, the court says, the, in this case, the Department of Interior, determined, determined that the environmental impacts are not sufficiently related to consider together, and the court defers to the agency's specialized competency or special uh, expertise on this. And they say, okay, the agency is the one that's best able to determine whether these coal leases are sufficiently related or not. Okay? Now, having said that, having said that, I said determined. Okay, and I emphasize that word. What does that mean? It means the agency actually 
gave a lot of attention to whether they were related or not, looked at the evidence, included the evidence in their decision, and made a reasoned argument or reasoned, um, had reasoning in the decision to support their, their determination that they are not related. So we see that? Okay, that is very different than just a conclusory assertion. Okay? So conclusory assertions do not do well under APA or NEPA. Right? We just start seeing that happen. The agency makes a conclusory determination, doesn't refer to the relevant factors, doesn't refer to evidence, doesn't look like it's made a careful reasoned decision, then the court's not going to defer to the agency. They say this is arbitrary and capricious. In this case, there was actual reason supported uh, the, uh, determination. We might, I mean, obviously the Sierra Club disagree with it, right? Different, different, reasonable minds dis differ disagree, but nonetheless, uh, the court says, well, this is the agency's expertise, special competence. So I talk about cumulative impacts. Um, this is uh, uh, a basic uh, definition about incremental impact of the action, past, present, reasonably uh, foreseeable future action, whether federal or not. Okay, so that's the CEQ regulations on uh, cumulative impacts. Um, there are uh, CEQ regulations on connected actions. Okay, so that's another thing, are the actions connected to each other? Um, and um, this is, uh, you get, um, you have to consider connected actions in a, in a single EIS. So if one action is connected to another, you have to look at the impacts of both actions and consider them together. Um, and connected actions are actions that cannot or will not proceed unless other actions are taken previously or simultaneously. So basically we're talking about they're interdependent on each other, right? So that is, um, um, uh, so you have to look at those. So the case uh, on, um, uh, the relevant case is a Ninth Circuit case, Thomas versus Peterson, uh, like those big logs there on the truck, right? Uh, so this is a, uh, this was two actions, and the, uh, the agency says, U.S. Forest Service says, we're building a logging road, so we have a road project. And they say, we're having a timber harvesting and sales program, and they're harvesting timber and selling. And the court says they're inextricably intertwined, and so you have to look at the cumulative impacts of both projects together in a single EIS instead of separate environmental uh, assessments, instead of separate EAs, um, okay, right? Because if you look at each one separately, it was determined that neither was going to have a significant impact on the environment. And notice what we're talking about. I mean, obviously, the road in the forest is going to have some impact on the environment. Right? It's hard to imagine the road not having some impact, but that's significant impact, okay? So the road below the significant threshold. Timber harvesting and sales below the three significant threshold. Why? In part because the, you know, timber harvesting usually comes with reforestation as well. Right? That's a mitigation, right? You're gonna cut the tree down, you find another one, right? That's another, right? And of course the Forest Service wants that. They want to be able to sell the sell the, the timber in the future after the tree grows again, right? Okay. So so together, though, they exceed the threshold of significance. So the court says they have to do this together. An agency said, you know, in our expertise, these are separate projects. But the court is not convinced. Um, and they um, and they said, um, you know, the question is are they being less deferential? But well, I think part of what's going on here is, again, it's that rule of reason, right? Just think about it for a moment. You wouldn't have the logging road if you weren't going to sell the timber, right? You harvest and sell the timber, right? You wouldn't need the logging road unless you have logs, right? That'd be pretty obvious. And you wouldn't be able to cut the trees and sell the timber unless you have a logging road. Right? So, I mean, okay, so now what we're seeing is not that the agency's being less deferential, but just they're applying the rule of reason, and any reasonable person would believe that these are interdependent on each other. Right? So we're seeing what that, 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 uh, what's going on here on that. Okay, I'm gonna give you a chance to, okay? okay. All right, I just wanna make sure. Um, all right. Um, so one of the things is called, that's out here is called the small handle problem, the small federal handle problem. Um, and uh, I think it's important. Uh, sometimes I think it gets a lot of attention because it sounds like a cool thing. You can go around and say, yeah, small federal handle problem, whatever. Uh, but I think uh, the, the, the gist here is that there are a lot of projects, a lot of actions that get taken that have both federal agency elements and non-federal elements. Right? And so let's assume you have a land development uh, project that is primarily going to be regulated at the local level. There may be some state regulations that apply. Obviously, there's private sector action that's happening as the pri private developers doing the development. But the developer needs a Section 404 permit under the Clean Water Act to fill in wetlands. Okay? And so the question is, does this now mean that the, um, the agency has to consider all of the impacts of the entire combination of federal and non-federal uh, uh, actions. And so you see, on one hand, all the impacts of the project, both federal and non-federal, are closely interrelated and may have significant cumulative impacts on the environment. But on the other hand, the federal authority of the project may be quite limited in scope legally, and broad, a broadly scoped EIS would be essentially federalized in non-federal project. Because they say, hey, we're doing, now doing an EIS on this private land development uh, project that's primarily local uh, level. Um, the, um, the judicial decisions are really very mixed on this. Okay? It's very mixed. Um, and it in part depends on whether the, well, it, it depends on how the agency has decided to scope its EIS. So, okay, so assume for a moment the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is going to do an EIS. Well, actually, they're going to start out doing an EA, right, on the Section 404 permit. They're going to issue a permit, Section 404 permit, to fill the wetlands for this development project. And so they're going to, um, they're going to do an EA, and they're going to ask, is the granting of this permit, that's the major federal action, is that going to have a significant impact on the environment or not? Okay. Uh, and if not, they'll issue a FONSI and so forth, right? Um, if they do an EIS, will the EIS be limited solely to the filling of the wetlands part? Does everybody see that? What if they choose to say, hey, we're going to look at the entire development project, all of its impacts, whether we have any control over them or not, and, um, and, and look at you know, uh, basically all the actions and all the impacts. Okay? So uh, a lot of it is going to turn then on what the agency decides to do. So if, and again, the cases are all over the map on this, but there, is, there's a, there, there are a number of cases where the courts defer to the agency, and usually the agency is 
looking at it narrowly. We're only going to assess the environmental impacts that are attributable solely to the federal government, the federal agency decision, right? Okay, so we're going to do it narrow, and usually that means a policy, okay? So, in, under what circumstances do you think the uh, courts will defer to these agencies? Okay? So there, there's this deference going on. When does the deference actually show up in the courts? What do you think? Think about what we were just talking about. What, what do you think is going to make the difference? <coughs> what is it in this last thing? Specialized expertise. And specialized expertise. And so how do we how do we know that? What do we know, what do we, what do we look for? Reasoning, evidence, support, right? It, you're giving, I'm, I'm going to keep emphasizing that. The more that the agency lays out a well-reasoned, well-supported decision, and by supported meaning by evidence, by, by facts, by data, right? It, if it looks like the agency has given this a lot of thought, or another way to say it's given a hard look, right? And considered it and said, hey, the action is only the federal agency part, and the impacts can be considered, the impacts of the weapon permit can be considered separately from the impacts of the development project as a whole, and here's why, and here's the support for that. That's when the agencies can get the most deference. Does everybody, everybody see that? Why? Why? Because the number one thing that the courts want the agencies to do is, is take their job seriously, is to, is to, you know, to, to apply the factors, the relevant factors, uh, uh, consider all the relevant evidence, and make a reasoned decision. Right? See, okay, so that keep, I'm going to keep emphasizing that pattern, because that's not always the right predictor of the, what the courts are going to do. Sometimes courts are more, um, more deferential, less deferential, but that's the best predictor. Um, okay, so um, the Sierra Club versus the U.S. is about um, some um, damage to um, visitor center and cabins and that kind of stuff in Yosemite National Park. Anybody been to Yosemite National Park? Oh my gosh. I've seen it on TV. <laughs> That's just, that's just wrong. That's so wrong. Okay, so, okay, I mean, we, we, okay, we need to get like a travel fund. Right? You guys need to get out and, okay, it's amazing. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. All right, so this is uh, Yosemite Village, Yosemite Lodge, uh, and so forth. Okay, lots and lots of people visit Yosemite. It's in the Sierra Nevada Mountains. It's in um, sort of uh, basically northeastern California. It's beautiful, it's amazing, um, and uh, you get lots of visitors. And so they were gonna have to do some reconstruction uh, of the lodge facilities, and other visitor facilities after a, uh, a major flood. And the National Park uh, Service is wanting to do this really fast, okay? Because lots of people visit. And it takes a while to rebuild all this stuff, and so we get it up and going. And so they prepared the EA and the sponsoring. Um, so basically, what they said is all of these impacts were previously considered in the park's general management plan and in its concession services plan. So they want to rely on the previous, um, uh, you know, the previous uh, plans. And so basically, what they're saying is, the, is NEPA allows for what's called tiering, okay? So tiers, right? Remember the tiers of, of um, analysis uh, where you can have a more you know, broader decisions where you consider a wide range of impacts, and then when you get down to the smaller, narrower decisions, you don't have to do as much analysis at that point because you considered it originally as part of the broader thing, right? Because everybody's saying that's the gist of this. Well, and, and the, the, the regs allow for tiering. But the court says, while tiering is normally permissible, it's not permissible in this case because the earlier plans were too general. They were too broad. They did not contemplate this kind of project. And so there were, uh, they, uh, there were no specific uh, and detailed descriptions uh, that would support NEPA analysis of this particular reconstruction project. Okay? So, uh, so part of this is introducing the tiering. Tiering is normally permissible, but there comes a point at which the earlier broad decision is way too broad, and the analysis was way too broad, and it didn't really contemplate this future uh, specific uh, uh, decision. Um, so um, the other thing is, um, part of what was going on is that uh, the uh, National Park Service um, did not um, really consider the no action alternative, okay? So part of what, part of what uh, was at issue here in addition to the earlier plan being too broad, the earlier plan never contemplated what would happen if the lodge got washed away, or these visitor facilities got washed away by flood, or destroyed, I mean, it didn't have to be a flood, but you just say, they got destroyed, and we simply didn't replace them, right? You see, in that case, it's the no-action alternative, right? And then, if, and so the no-action alternative has to be considered in your NEPA analysis, okay? No-action alternative has to be considered in your NEPA analysis. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna skip the next two slides. They're not, they're not that important. Um, okay, so, um, the uh, Marsh versus the United States um, is about um, a duty to prepare a supplemental EIS with new information about the impacts of a project come to light after the project is approved, but before it's completed. And part of, uh, part of it is when the case is introduced you to this requirement, the supplemental EIS does have to be prepared if there are new, project, uh, new, uh, new uh, information, new impacts of the project. But it's also to emphasize this rule of reason again that the courts um, give a lot of attention to, which is what's the value of the new information on the still pending decision making uh, process? And so there are um, two questions. Is there still a major federal action left to occur? If so, then you ask, is the new information sufficient to show that the remaining action will affect the quality of the human environment in a significant manner, so to a significant effect, to extent not already considered? And if that's yes as well, so yes to both, then a supplemental EIS will uh, be prepared. And lo and behold, boom, right here, this is what I've been saying all class period, the court will defer to the agency's determinations if it appears the agency has taken a hard look at the information and did not make an arbitrary and capricious decision when the information, that the information was not significant. So it's at the same can they, can they consider everything? Can they make a reasoned decision? Can the court see that? So the bottom line is, when the agency doesn't take a hard look, it's bad for the agency. The, the courts are more likely to say they fail to, uh, to uh, uh, follow NEPA. So uh, if they fail to prepare an EIS, when they actually like it has a significant impact on the human environment, the agency's going to lose. They fail to follow the mandatory process, the agency's going to lose. They fail to consider important impacts, alternatives, including the no-action alternatives or evidence, the agency's going to lose. They engage in summary, conclusory, cursory analysis, the agency's going to lose. 
if the agency reaches patently unreasonable decisions or conclusions based on the standards and evidence that's in the record, right? So the, record, the standards are there, and the evidence is there, and then the court's like, huh? This doesn't make any sense but in terms of what the agency actually decided. Agency to lose. So, coming back to your role with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service regarding prairie dogs and grasslands, okay? Once you get to the point of having one or more proposals for action to deal with that, you're gonna have to go through the NEPA process, right? Right? But you're like, I knew there was a point to this all along, right? We went through all this. Well, that's because you to apply it, right? And so one of the things is you're going to want to advise your agency or, or in your role as sort of overseeing as assistant director to ensure that the agency does its EIS work, takes a hard look, makes it, uh, its decision with clear reference to the EIS. Or if there's not an EIS, to make sure that the FONSI is well supported. Right? Um, and again, you can choose to do environmentally harmful things, but you have to be transparent about them doing so. So that's the gist. Um, there is some uh, discussion, um, which we've sort of already talked about, so I'm going to give this sort of short, uh, short amount of attention, which is, um, this need to um, force better decision making by federal agencies. And so I think there's some pretty good evidence that agency decisions after NEPA was adopted uh, are much more environmentally conscious, they're much more aware of environmental impacts, um, there, that there are plenty of actions that do not get taken because the environmental impacts are brought to light. Uh, there's litigation over it, um, so uh, sometimes that just ends up you know, uh, um, deterring the agency or deterring the project proponents from moving forward. But one of the challenges is that um, NEPA analysis is very linear, right? You're at a given point in time, and you are trying to make some predictions about the future environmental impacts of a proposed action. And so that requires a fair amount of confidence in the agency's ability to predict what those actions are going to be, right? to, to model them, to gather data about what they could be, uh, to, to, um, uh, to, to, to uh, know or predict accurately what they're going to be, um, and to assume that everything is going to play out in this linear fashion where you know you you make the decision and then you know, step one happens and then step two happens and then step three happens and boom there you go right and what we know from our discussion the other day about you know the episode four of the environmental law is that there's a lot of uncertainty complex dynamics instability um surprise disturbances you know that basically we said you know, unprecedented is the new normal right and so nepa is not very well adapted to that it doesn't it doesn't really tell you what do you do if you don't have the foggiest idea what's going to happen or you have 10 different competing models of what the future might look like or um if you make a decision based on a, a set of assumptions about the future, and then as you get implementing the decision, it turns out you're terribly wrong, or something goes awry. You, you know, you, I mean, and, and go back to the example. You made an assessment, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, for example, made an assessment about the canals and, and uh, levees that uh, were designed to hold back floodwaters from New Orleans, right? And they were terribly wrong, terribly wrong. And they simply did not consider several different factors that intersecting together meant that they had, I forget, it was like three dozen different breaches of those levees, which meant that all of New Orleans flooded, after Katrina, it was actually after the, after the storm hit, right? That was the problem. And it, and it was because their assumptions were all based on a set of um, uh, predictions that made sense at, at one time, but just did not contemplate that something like uh, Katrina could happen. Okay? So, um, so we're, we're, this is just about, you know, we've already seen about adaptive management. So, okay? so um, on one hand, I think we, we uh, might say there's more accountability to the public because of NEPA, there's more information. And the other thing I pointed out the other day is we actually now gather a lot more information and we have better models about what the impacts of what we do are because of NEPA, because it's now because it's legally demanded, that creates, I mean, it's like it creates a market for it, right? I mean, so, so if you think about this, agencies need this. So what does this mean? It means there are a bunch of scientists running around U of L and other places doing these kinds of studies because there's a demand for that kind of knowledge and that kind of modeling or that kind of, of assessment process, right? I mean, so, so, so that's part of what the, the benefits of NEPA have been. Uh, whether it's actually um, uh, done enough to you know, make environmental better, uh, environmentally better decisions, um, uh, that's not good. All right. So that's NEPA. Um, at the end of class, I want you to take um, one of these, which is this, and I just ignore the fall 2017. Um, it's, it's, the standards haven't changed since, uh, since I taught environmental law two years ago, and this is a PDF. I don't want to go in and try to change it. So, so, but these are federal land management legal standards. So we're talking about them. Okay, so we're talking about them on Monday. But uh, what I want to do now is turn to the fact that um, some uh, way that you as a um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service official, uh, you as an employee of the U.S. Department of Interior, might be able to get a handle on um, grassland conservation and prairie dog conservation is to focus on federal lands, okay? on uh, lands owned by the federal government, because whether it's your agency or not, at least it's the federal government that controls what happens on those lands. Okay? Um, and we previously talked about the various different kinds of federal lands that are out there. There are national parks, right? there are national forests, there are um, uh, national, fish and, uh, uh, national fish and wildlife refuges, right? Uh, or national wildlife refuges. Um, there are what are called BLM lands, Bureau of Land Management lands, these are sort of general purpose uh, lands uh, and so forth. Um, there's something called the national grasslands, okay? so that's a particular designation. Um, uh, and of course there's national parks. Each of these categories has been um, established by Congress pursuant to what's called an organic act. Okay? So there is what's called an organic act, and it's called organic because it means these are the big broad principles for designating and managing certain lands as you know, for, for these certain purposes. So national parks are managed a particular way by the National Park Service. National wildlife refuges are managed another way uh, for, by the U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, and so on and so forth. You know, the national forests, and so forth. So you have these organic acts. Then for some of the lands, you have 
additional federal statutes that establish land management procedures and standards, land management procedures and standards that cut across um, all, whether it's national parks or all forests or you know, so on and so forth. And then you have statutes designating particular units, particular units. So they were there, there actually back in the, in the 40s was when the, um, the Everglades National Park was established, right? And there was a specific statute establishing the Everglades National Park and the standards for managing the Everglades National Park are different and distinct from the standards for managing Yosemite, the standards for managing Mammoth National, Cave, Mammoth Cave National Park, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so that these these are what are called establishment acts, and these are when Congress has established a particular unit. So they, you know, there's the Medicine Bow National Forest in Wyoming, okay, and there's a particular forest, and there's going to be a specific establishment act for the Medicine Bow National Forest. So what does that mean? It means that agencies that are responsible for managing a particular unit of federal land are going to have a series of federal statutes that direct them as far as the standards and procedures for managing those federal lands. Okay? And so we're going to go through and talk about this. We're going to start though um, um, before we. Yeah, we're starting at the end of class now. We've got five more minutes, and then we're going to pick this up because I want you to think about it. But I want you to think a little bit about um, something we, we started talking about um, earlier in the semester, which is cultural competence. Okay? So cultural competence is about considering a range of diverse perspectives right, on um, environmental issues, legal issues, and so forth. So, so part of thinking about how an agency might go about implementing these necessitates thinking about how different groups and populations, particularly those groups and populations that are maybe less powerful or you know, more on the margins or maybe more in the minority or something like that, how they might um, have different viewpoints about federal lands than the agency might, or than sort of the mainstream population might. Okay? So let's, let's think about this for a moment. Native American tribes, Indian tribes, how do you think they view federal lands? What do you think what's, what the Native American, I don't want to suggest that there's any perspective, but I think we can find some, some um, commonalities that you find with many Native American tribes in sort of ways that they might look at federal lands. Start here. One thing that's going on here is you kind of think out outside, right, of, of your, your experience outside of, uh, of your particular perspective. No, I have no idea. I'm going to say, no. Maybe they just really don't care about them. Okay. Like, okay. They feel like that used to be their land, maybe, or we our land are protected, so why do I care about that? Okay, so, so let's start with the, the, the first part of that, which is, okay, where did these, where did these uh, lands come from? Well, originally, they were lands possessed and controlled by Native American tribes, right? right? I mean, so, so that, I mean, that is significant. The tribe no longer controls those lands. So, you know, if, for example, the Grand Canyon, there are parts of it that are considered sacred to certain tribes, Right? But that's all, it's all controlled and run by some federal agency with a bunch of other priorities. Right? So, okay, so you see that that's one way to sort of think about it. All right. It's possible then that that might lead to a certain amount of you know, diffidence about this. Right? You're saying, well, who, you know, I mean, this isn't ours and this, we're not on the same page as uh, these agencies. But I think it might, might be a, the opposite. Yeah. I don't know, and again, I don't know how to put generalizing that usually they believe that the land is actually belonging to anybody or belongs to everybody. And so even if federal land is actually a public land at that point, so it's at least not being held by private land owners. So, so one thing is the public nature of it becomes closer. It's not the same, but it becomes closer to this idea that this is a community resource or a shared resource. Okay, the other thing to think about, because we're just almost out of time, is what, what about the extent to which the federal management serves conservation purposes? Okay, so now there is not going to be privatized. It's not going to be developed. It's not going to be, you know, right? So, so for example, yes, there are visitors um, to, you know, people coming and tromping around and taking pictures and selfies and whatnot, right? But you're, you're protecting these ecological resources that the, that the uh, tribes consider valuable. So for example, there's enormous controversy over Bears Ears National Monument in Utah, right? The scope of it and how it was done and so on and so forth. And so it was very uh, broadly done in the Obama administration and then it was vastly shrunk back in the, in the Trump administration. Well, one of the things that has yeah, as part of that, that process is that a lot of the, the tribes in Utah pushed back or were joined in the lawsuits against the shrinking of Bears Ears National Monument because they wanted those lands to be protected. They viewed them as sacred, they viewed them as important, and so they viewed the National Monument designation as helping to serve their goals and their interests. Okay? So, so part of what I'm trying to get you to do is sort of think about those different perspectives. So one thing we're talking about, and we think about at the beginning of class is, what about lower income uh, groups, lower income communities? What about communities of color, people who, you know, how do they sort of think about national parks and uh, public lands and other kinds of things? So we're going to start talking about that at the end of class, and then we're going to turn and look at the very specific kinds of standards that uh, govern. Uh, but be sure to take a look at, I'm going to also post this on, on Blackboard. I'm going to start right here and take a look at that before class on Monday. Uh,